Well, good morning. Oh, you're too kind. You're making me blush, seriously. Well, hey, welcome. We're in a series called Parables, and if you've been around for this series, it's been fun. I'm, I've been challenged. I've been learning a lot. It's been so good to dive into what Jesus taught in these parables or these stories. And man, it's been so good. We've been dissecting them, and I hope you've been enjoying that. I hope you've been in the small groups, enjoying that follow-up conversation that happens after these parables. So let's go. Week six. We're over the halfway point. Week six of ten. Here we go. Ready? Question for you. What's the one thing in your life that you wish you could go back and redo? What's the one maybe thing that you did that, uh, one, the one bad thing that you did you wish you could go back? Okay, of the many bad things that you did, what's the one that you would go back? Because that one really hurt people. It caused some dysfunction and separation in my family and friends. Maybe it was something that you said that really hurt somebody and caused some craziness. Maybe there was an opportunity of something that you should have said or an opportunity or a door open that you should have walked through that you didn't. But now looking back, hindsight, you're like, man, I wish I would have did that. What's that one time, that one thing that you wish you could go back and get a redo? For me, it'd be in 2010. And I don't have time to tell you what happened in 2010. You can email me. You can Facebook me. You can direct message me. We'll grab a coffee. I'll tell you about my redo. I'd love to hear about your redo, but we all got something, right? We probably all got some type of redo. And we have the phrase that we say all the time is, I wish I knew uh, then what I know now. Like if I would have just known. Man, if I could have saw the future. And I want to take that same mindset and look at kind of investments in the financial stock market. Some of you may know exactly what I'm talking about. Great. Some of you are like, what's the stock market? That's fine. Listen up. You'll, you'll understand. You'll track with me. Here we go. You have investments, okay? And, and based on what you invest and how much over a period of time, it would earn interest and it would kind of grow and, and its value would increase. Let me tell you this. What if you knew the return of your possible investment? You're going to invest in the ones that you know have the good return. So if you could see the future, right? If you could know the future on your investments, you would make the right investment or the better investment or the best investment if you just knew. And, and, and Microsoft is the world's largest software company. And in March 13th, 1986, March 13th, 1986, the stock market started selling shares of Microsoft. Okay? And if you would have invested in 1986 $1,000 in Microsoft, okay, today that would be worth $1.6 million. Man, come on, Dad. Why didn't you do that for me? Why, like, I want to go back to 86 and say, Dad, buy me a college fund, 1000 bucks in Microsoft. That way when I graduate from college, I can pay off my debts. You know what I'm saying? Like, why couldn't that be part of my story? You guys know Peter Thiel? Anybody? Yeah, me either. I didn't know, Peter. Okay, we have one pretty awesome. I had no idea. I looked it up. It's what Google's for. I should invest in Google maybe too. But, so I Googled Peter Thiel. In 2005, Peter Thiel took $500,000 and invested in a thing called Facebook. 2005. 2012 rolls around. Seven years. He sells 80% of his shares for $400 million. Man, I want to be a Thiel. Like, I kind of want to, I want that to be my dad or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I could go back and just have known the, 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 the significance of those investments, I probably would have got in on the ground floor with Microsoft. If I would have just known ahead of time, I could have made the right investments. And here's the thing. We all got to redo. We all wish we could go back. And the thing about Jesus, and the thing I'm really discovering and really coming to love about Jesus and the scriptures and the word of God is that Jesus isn't going to leave any room for that. He's going to go ahead and give us the return before we invest. He's going to go ahead and kind of lay it all out for us and say, this is what heaven's like. This is what it means to be a follower of me. I'm going to show you that we call these kingdom parables. I'm going to give you some insight beforehand, before you invest, before you make the decision, before you begin to follow me. I love that about Jesus. So if we get into heaven one day, say you do, you know, make that decision and accept Christ and you do get into heaven. I don't want us to walk in going, I wish I would have known. Like, I, I wish somebody would have told me. Jesus is probably going to be like, I tried telling you. Look, this book, I said all this stuff. They wrote it down. We've preserved this document for thousands and thousands of years for you to see what the return on your investment should look like if you are a Christ follower. And if that happens to you, you show up in heaven going, man, I wish I would have known. That's on you because it's right here in the Word of God, in the Bible. Jesus lays it all out for us in these par parables. 
So Jesus, as he always does, he, he addresses the crowd. And I think in this parable, and even last week's parable about the, the ten mina, he's got some excitement about him. He's like, yo, listen up. I got something amazing for you. I'm about to let you in on a little bit of a secret. He's got some excitement, I think, and he's really passionate about what he's saying. So this week is kind of a part two of last week's message of the parable of the ten minus. So if you missed last week, shame on you. I'm kidding. We have the internet. The internet was invented 30 years ago, the World Wide Web. It's phenomenal. We have a website. We record. We post them. Go back and watch if you missed last week's parable because this one kind of ties right in as part two. And Jesus is going to give us... The, the investments beforehand, he's going to give us the portfolio. He's going to tell us this is, the way, this is the best return on your investment, so invest here. He's kind of given us the test, or, or sorry, he's given us the answer sheet before we sit down and take the test. And I love that, and I love that. So I'm calling this message, if you got your notes in your program, you want to follow along in your notes and jot some things down, fantastic. You'll see the title of this is Life Planning by Jesus. And realistically, there's, there's, a, there's a pretty heavy chunk on financial planning, but I'm not going to go there. I want to just view it as life planning, and let's understand that there's a financial message in this as well. Life planning. So let's look at Jesus, the, the, the most magnificent and the greatest life planner ever, and using the word of God as the greatest life guide that could ever been given to human beings. And Jesus is the ultimate financial planner and the ultimate life planner. So let's dive in. Life planning by Jesus. We'll be in Luke 16. If you got your Bibles, want to get there, please do. Smartphones, Luke 16. If you just want to sit back, kick it, and look on the screen, we got that for you. We got you covered. Luke 16, it's called the parable of the shrewd manager. Start out this way. Jesus told his disciples. He told his disciples. So pause for a second. He's talking to his followers. He's talking to those who have made the, made the decision to follow him. He's saying, you know what? You people that are following me and choosing me and putting your faith in me and being obedient to me, I'm going to give you what this life is all about. I'm going to show you what I want you to do with your time, your talents, your efforts, your money. I want to show you what to do with your stuff is what he's saying. And then I think he would say to the non-believers, and if that's you and you're just checking church out, you've just been kind of sitting in the back and like, I'm not sure what I think, but I'm trying to put the pieces together. He, Jesus in this parable is going to give you a picture of what the Christian faith should look like before you even say yes. And I want to apologize if you've ever been hurt by a Christian, judged or ripped off or any which way that something, there's a scar, there's some baggage. I apologize. But Jesus is going to tell us in this parable, this is what it should look like. You're going to know what you're investing in before you invest. And you can make the best decision on whether or not you want to invest in this. So no matter where you are today, a Jesus follower, not a Jesus follower, it's a great day for you to be here. Here we go. There's a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm, I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will come, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors and he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager said, not today. Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Wow, what a sale. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe my master? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, nah, -uh. take your bill. Can you make it eight, man, make it 800? Cutting deals. The master, verse 8, commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, Jesus tells us, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. Man, so the very first, the first three words is he's teaching his disciples. 
But guess what? There's a lot more people listening in than his disciples. And that's what I love about this parable. A lot of times Jesus will teach in a way in which multiple demographics or socioeconomic classes or different people from different walks of life can have one story and take two different things away from it. And that's so powerful. And I love that. Because let's face it, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he's been around for a little while. And everyone's starting to gather and trying to figure out what this dude's all about. He's like, apparently this guy can walk on water. Apparently this guy can talk to the storm and it'll listen to him. Apparently he can feed 10,000 people with a boy's sack lunch. Everybody's captivated. Everybody's trying to figure out what this dude is all about. Even the Pharisees. Even the Pharisees, even the religious ones, even though, even though people who had perfect church attendance, even the people who consider themselves better morally, ethically, theologically, with understanding, and their walk with Christ is way better than yours is, those type of people are listening as well. And Jesus knows this, and he's speaking to both crowds. You know, and, and these perfect church attendees, these people who have this better walk with Christ, these, Pharise- these Pharisaical people, you know, they look at the rest of the world and make judgments on the rest of the world and consider themselves better. They hear this story, and what do they do? They sneer at Jesus. They literally lift their nose at Jesus and say, no, nah, that's, t- that's crazy. I'm not going to accept what you're saying. And then Jesus comes back to them directly after they sneer. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So Pharisees, you know that stuff that you are judging yourself according to? God doesn't like that stuff. He says it's uh, detestable in his eyes, in his sight. He hates it, right? He hates the stuff that you are considering, that you're grading yourself upon. And this story is for you, those Pharisees. It's also for his followers, the ones who get it. But it's also for the ones who maybe think that they're better than everybody else. This story is for you as well. And these stories, man, especially this story, this parable's got some twists and some turns. And I look at this parable and go, seriously? Did I really just see a crooked guy doing some crooked business and getting applauded for it? He's getting pat on the back for doing some crooked, ripping off his master and doing some really dishonest things. Yeah, yeah, I'm reading that right. But up to this point, the thing that's confusing sometimes is up to this point, Jesus was teaching, live a moral and ethical life. Live a moral and ethical life. Don't, don't, cheat, don't cheat, don't steal, don't rip people off, love people. But then he's going to start praising a dishonest manager who acted shrewdly and was ripping off his master. The thing we got to understand here, Jesus is not commending the dishonesty. He's calling him a dishonest manager. He's giving him credit for that. He's commending the shrewdness, the way in which the manager acted. And I define shrewdness for us. The quality of having or showing good powers of judgment. The ability to show and to make good judgment. That's what's being applauded about this man. This manager makes really good judgment regarding the possessions and the things that he had at his disposal in the moment. That's what's getting applauded. So the manager hears, or the, uh, the master hears about this guy. He's like, hey, you know that manager you got running your stuff? Oh, he's awesome, isn't he? No, no, no. Now he's wasting your stuff, dude. You need to go check the books for yourself. So the master, when he gets enough information, he goes down, he goes down, and, 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 he, and he sees in, in the first line, it says, the rich man w- whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. The guy that you have in charge is wasting your stuff. So he comes down and he addresses the manager and says, hey, you, you can't work here any longer. You need to get your account in order. You need to settle everything that you've been wasting and figure it out because you're gone. I can't use you anymore. And then, and then the manager's like, well, what am I going to do? Look at these wet noodle arms. I can't do manual labor. My back ain't strong enough to dig holes. Like, who's going to hire me? He's like, I'm too prideful. You know, I'm too arrogant to, to, to beg. I'm not going to go beg for my well-being. What am I going to do now? And in that moment of losing his job, a light bulb goes off in his head. He has an aha moment. He's like, something switches. A fire is lit underneath of him. He's like, I know what I got to do next. I know how I'm going to take on the next chapter, the next career move, the next segment of my life. I know what I have to do. He's going to make some friends. He's going to create some IOUs. He's going to create some relationships to when he's out and about and no money or no income and no place to live. He's got people who will welcome him and accept him. He's like, I got to get some people on my side. 
I got to get some pe- people on my team. And the ironic thing about this story is that the folks listening in are both the Jesus followers and the Pharisees. And the Pharisees. The perfect church attendees, the ones who compare and just really are judgmental. They sneer at Jesus and they say, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I love my money. I'm tight-fisted with my money. It's me, 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 selfish, materialistic mindset of those Pharisees. They're like, I ain't doing that. Kidding me? I'm not going to use my wealth. I'm not going to use my money. I'm not going to use my stuff to get friends, to, to invest in people and relationships. I'm not going that far. They sneered at Jesus. They were upset at Jesus. And the thing about Jesus is so, so crazy and cool at the same time is he would rather pick a dishonest manager and commend him for his shrewdness than to pick the Pharisees. And that's got to sting a little bit if you think about it. No wonder the Pharisees wanted to kill him. I mean, come on. Like, that is just a hard blow, and it's such a sting, a sting left in, in, in the uh, Pharisees' mouth. So what does this all mean today? What does all of this apply? How does this all mean? What does this all mean for us today? Life planning by Jesus. And the first point is do not fall for fool's gold. Don't fall for false value, things of false value. Do not be tricked into believing fool's gold. And the first point in your notes is the end of our life is a myth. Plan for beyond death. If the end of our life is a myth, we got to plan for beyond death. You see, a lot of times we take this, 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 uh, this idea or we believe or our culture and our society tells you, dude, gather up enough wealth for yourself now. Plan that retirement, your kid's retirement, figure it all out. Maybe go get that education, go get another piece of education so you can get the right job with the right level of income so that you can acquire enough wealth for yourself. And maybe if schooling wasn't the route for you, you got gifts and talents and abilities and you can get right into the workforce and you start climbing that corporate ladder, we start to believe the myth that we got to plan everything before death. We got to get enough so that when my physical body and my mental capacities can no longer work, I'm not left homeless or destitute. I have enough to live comfortably in my old age. I got to plan to death, man. But Jesus wants to pull the plug on that entire myth. All throughout scripture, Jesus is saying, no, don't you realize if you're a Jesus follower, you don't die. You don't die. There is no such thing as death. Yeah, this earthly body is going to go away. This temporary body on this earth will die. But guess what? You're an eternal being. And you're going to spend it in two places, heaven or hell. And it's based on your decision of whether or not you follow Christ and accept the gift of salvation that he's offering you. If you do that, don't you realize you're not going to die? This is for his Jesus followers. This is for his disciples. Don't you get that? So don't believe the lie or the myth that we got to plan everything to death. There's so much more after this life. The temporary is here and now, but we are eternal beings. And I don't know if you believe that. I don't know if you believe creation. I don't know if you, what you believe about God and humanity. I don't know where you are with that. But I, we believe that we are all eternal. And we're going to spend it in two places. And that decision's up to us where we spend it. So don't plan for the here and now, it's for the temporary. And Jesus is showing us a guy who understood temporary, right? The manager understood, oh boy, I only got about four hours left, you know? This job's over with. And I think the correlation to us is this. It's really encouraging, you ready? You're gonna die. Say it with me, I'm gonna die. Some of you are like, man, I want an encouraging, uplifting message. This dude's telling me I'm gonna die, you know? But seriously, that's a fact of being a human being on this earth. It's gonna come to an end going to die. It's temporary. The manager knew it's temporary. I don't have much time left. I better do something with the time that I have left. You know, Jesus is saying, showing us a guy who understood the temporary. And Jesus is trying to communicate to us, don't you understand this life is temporary? So don't tell me, Jesus is saying, don't tell me you're planning just for death here. Don't tell me that you're just using your talents, your time, and your abilities for here. Don't tell me you're leveraging everything that you have at your disposable for me, me, me. Don't tell me that. Tell me you're doing it for eternity. Tell me that you're leveraging it for eternity. This this would be like this. If you told your kid that they only live to be 15 years old, and and you're teaching your kid that, and your kid's living his life, it's like, man, i got to just get everything in within 15 years. And then that 16th birthday, the kid wakes up and goes, well, this is weird. (laughs) I didn't expect this to happen. I wasn't prepared for this. That's a foolish parenting move. Jesus is saying the same thing. Don't you realize that this thing's going to go away? And you've got a whole other life in eternity that's at stake here. Let me tell you about next chapter. Let me show you a guy who understood next chapter. 
Let me show you a manager who realized in the temporary final days of his job, he had to do whatever it took to invest in people. So don't plan for the here and now. That's foolish. That's fool's school. Don't fall for that. So then you're asking me, hopefully you're asking the question, well, what do I put value in? Where do I invest? Great question. You guys are awesome question askers. Because I have the answer for that question only. So if you ask another one, knows. The only investments that count, point two, the only investments that count are people. The only investments that count, that matter, are people. Let's face it. The only thing that's going to spend eternity is people. Because we are eternal beings. And if we believe in Jesus and accept Christ, we're going to heaven. We're, we are eternal. The only thing getting into heaven is people. Is people. You know, my seven iron <laughs> isn't going with me. The firearms that I own, they're not going with me. My, my retirement fund, 401k, my bank account's not going with me. Whatever you have on this earth as a temporary possession is not going with you. The only thing getting into heaven is people. I still got my golf clubs. I like using my golf clubs. I enjoy that. I got my firearms. I enjoy those. I, I really like having a retirement fund. You know, I really, I like having a bank account. Those things aren't bad. Jesus is just saying, hey, I need you to put them in the right priority. I need you to put them in the order of significance of what truly matters in this life. The only thing making it into heaven is people. This is for Christians. This is for the Christ followers. This is the people who've made that step of faith. Don't you get it? It's not about here. It's about eternity. And people are the only investments that actually matter. Jesus is showing us a manager and giving us a story and giving us the insight of, hey, where are you going to invest? Where are you going to invest? You thought Microsoft was a good investment in 86? Nah, that's crap. That's garbage compared to what I'm telling you about. You thought investing in Facebook in 2005 and being a Theo was cool and what you needed to do? Nah, like, that's nothing. That's rubbish, man. That's, that's nothing compared to what I'm asking you to do and showing you where to invest your time and your money and your resources. Let me give you something better than that, Jesus is saying. And all throughout the Bible, I want to debunk another myth. All throughout the Bible, Jesus and even God tells us he wants us to be wealthy. There's nothing wrong with that. Just put it in the order of significance and importance of what it means. And I would, I would even dare to say this. God wants us to be incredibly wealthy and successful, wildly successful. He's just begging us and telling us, don't do it here. Don't just simply gather and gain and store up for yourself here. Store up for yourself wealth and incredible success in heaven where moth and rust and thieves and nothing can steal and take that away from you. Be incredibly successful and wealthy, but just don't put it all here. Plan for eternity. Store for yourselves treasure in heaven is a theme that I see over and over and over again in the scriptures and in Jesus' teaching. And it's going to be awesome if we do this. And the only thing spending eternity in heaven is people. So we need to invest in people. The manager knew this. He's like, I have to go make it right with people. And in verse 9, he says something that just really challenged me. This verse 9 is, is one of the most controversial verses in, in all of the parables. I was doing some, some research, and it was amazing to see the, the, the disunity on this. So let's dive in. Let's tackle this hard verse. Verse 9, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. Is Jesus telling us to buy our friends? I don't know. Seems like that may be some of the insinuation here. But what I do believe, and the theme that I do see in Scripture over and over and over again, and not hanging on one verse, is that we need to leverage and invest in people for the betterment of that individual and for the mutually beneficial relationship that will begin because of our love, our kindness, and our generosity. That's a theme that's undeniable in Jesus' teachings. Leverage your wealth, gain friends, better their life, earn a friend that you can rely on. They'll support you and care for you, and you guys can help each other out in times of need. And you're probably thinking, Myron, do I have to do this? Do, do, is this like a, a requirement? If, if I'm a Christian, is this something I have to do? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you might get into heaven. I think we need to do this. You might get into heaven, 
But there might not be anybody there excited to see you or welcome you in to eternal dwellings. You know? It's like, I, I, I use this visual, and I don't know if this is theologically accurate, but we may be in heaven like, well, who lives down Lonely Street? Why is there nobody around him? Apparently he didn't invest or she didn't invest in people here. There's nobody excited and, and, and like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for what you did for me. Your fingerprint was on my life because you let me bunk in your house for a week. You fed me when I was hungry. You did this or this or this for me or you gave me this money so that I wouldn't starve. Whatever it is, that person may get into heaven and will be excited when you show up because you played a part in their story. And that's what I want. That's probably what you want, too. You want to show up and be a party, and people are excited and welcoming you into heaven. You're not going to want to get to heaven and not be greeted by people and realize, well, I kind of missed it. I guess I would have invested in people now because I'm going to spend it with people later. Because of your time and your talents and your influence, have you leveraged everything for the betterment of somebody else so they may have a chance to get into eternity? Because that's what matters. That's what Jesus is saying. And this, this manager that got commended realized that everything at his disposal was a tool that he was going to use for people. For people. And you're, some of us are probably still thinking, is this just for the overachievers? <laughs> like, what, what's the bare minimum? What's just the, what's the, the one thing or the, the simplest thing I got to do to get into heaven? I just want to get into paradise, man. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. Maybe you're sneering at Jesus a little bit. Maybe you're not sure whether or not this applies to you. And I think this stems from a belief that, that heaven's going to be equal. Okay? That heaven's going to be equal. But I don't know where we're getting that from. I believe, and Scripture kind of screams out and tells us, there's going to be great inequality in heaven. And that might ruffle your feathers or your theology, and you may be mad at me, and you may be thinking, no, you're wrong, Myron. There's going to be fairness in heaven. You're right. You'll get what you deserve. <laughs> That's fair. You're going to get what you deserve in heaven. The reward system in heaven that we see in Scripture means there's going to be great inequality. And that's, that's awesome for me. That fires me up because I used to have this belief about heaven that we were going to sit on one large wooden hard pew and have this really long endless hymnal. Well, that doesn't sound very exciting. Beats hell just because it's colder, you know. That doesn't sound like paradise to me, but, but maybe a hierarchy of management. I have responsibilities. I got treasure stored up for me. I got a job to do. I'm going to be ruling and reigning and living and, and hanging out with Jesus and, and celebrating with Jesus. That sounds awesome to me. That sounds exciting to me. And some of you are like, I don't know what I think about that. That's why I put a ton of scripture references in your notes about this next point. If you don't like that, you're mad at me, please don't be mad at me, be mad at the Bible. Go read it and see what the Bible says about eternity and the inequality that will be created. Fairness, a great reward system, means great inequality. Leads me to my final point. This life is simply a resume for what we do in eternity. This life is simply a resume that will allow me to do what I'm going to do in heaven and will give me what I will have in heaven. Right? My mansion, my rewards, my crowns. Jesus talked a lot about thrones and rewards and ruling and reigning and all of that stuff. And it's based on what we do now. It is the resume. And it's just like last week we talked about the parable of the ten mina. You missed it, go back and watch it. Let me recap real quick for you. There was a king who was going to go away. And he was going to leave a mina with three different individuals. And he said, I want you to go and invest and gain and grow this mina. And mine is just simply a unit of measure, okay? Go and gain and invest and, and push this forward. The first guy does. And he comes back. When the, when the king returns, he comes to that first guy. He says, what have you done with my mina? He said, I've, I, I have gained 10 mina. And, and, the, and the master says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because of that, you will now be in charge of 10 cities. The second guy that had the mina invested it and returned five mina. Good job, my good and faithful servant. Because you returned five, you'll be in charge of five cities. Then the last guy took his mina, put it in a cloth, hid it away, and waited for the master to come back and said, I got your mina. And he took the mina from the guy and gave it to somebody else who was actually going to invest it and grow it. I think that's a direct picture of what heaven's going to be like. What have you done with what you have been given here in the temporary? 
How much have you increased and gained and invested in people? The only thing that matters will directly determine what you will have and what you will do in heaven. There's no equality in heaven. So what we do now determines what we will do then. And you don't want to walk in with no one there to greet you. You don't want to be Lonely Street guy. You don't want to miss out on the return on the investment that Jesus has given us a picture into beforehand. You don't want to miss out on that. Don't miss that. Jesus is giving us the portfolio ahead of time. Jesus is giving us the answer key before we even get there. And that's why I love these parables, man. That's why I love these parables. They've given us an insight into what the kingdom of God is all about. And that's why I love this church. There's a lot of you in these rows and seats right now that get this. And there's some of us that don't. But I love the ones that do, and I love this church because we, we do get this. And there's always more that we can do. We can always get better at this. But I hear stories, and, and I love being on staff here and a part of this church because I get to hear the stories of people investing in other people. I want to commend the 180 group, man, that just had a weekend service opportunity, a weekend getaway. It was amazing. They went to Madison Elementary School. And they helped continue build the sensory garden that we've embarked upon, building that sensory garden for Madison. They were doing work there. They went to a single mom's house, cleaned up her yard, made it look fantastic, did some work on the inside, getting her ready for that home. Remarkable. They painted a wall at the house of the carpenter, serving the house of the carpenter. They are investing in people. So good job. It's awesome. I hear... I hear stories of adoption, and and it just, it warms my heart, man. And if you've done that, I know there's people in this room and in this church who've adopted a child, you are making an eternal difference in that child's life. Some of you are thinking about adoption, or maybe that you're in the process of adoption. Thank you. You get it. And you know the significance and the importance and the investment that you have in that child's life will have eternal impact. I love those stories. I hear stories of what we did, the cooking for the homeless, so for the free shelter. We fed the homeless all winter. It's a fantastic thing that a team of people from this church did. They used their gifts of cooking, their time to make these meals, to serve and invest in those people. There's a team that goes to the prison and runs the Alpha Course. They're bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ and loving the inmates at that prison. People get this, and we hear these stories, and it just fires me up because we get it. And then the stories out of our life group so far have been so cool. And if you have a story in your life group of some way you're doing this, share it with me. Get on the website, email me, Mike, direct message me. We want to know about these stories. But a few of them I'll share with you. Tisa Miner's mom was, or mom was moving out of an apartment. And a man was going to move into that apartment. And that man, he was previously homeless. And he's now going to get a home. But then Tisa realized he doesn't have anything. So Tisa gathered her small group. And said, hey, let's provide everything this guy will need for his kitchen and his bathroom. Look at these photos. This is unbelievable. They got the kitchen stocked. Everything that he'll need. They stocked his bathroom with towels and soap and stuff. I mean, that just is unbelievable that a group of people using their own resources and their time and their efforts to help that homeless man get back on his feet in a home. Powerful. People get this. Another story from our small groups is there was a there was, there's, there's some single ladies and some widows that are now companions for each other and friends for each other. And, and they help, they help uh, you know, not feel so lonely. They cook for each other. They take care of each other. That group of women are serving and investing in each other, and it's powerful. And one of my favorites is this. There was a mom and a child who got really sick and spent a couple days in the hospital. Their life group comes in and sanitizes and cleans the entire house. That's what it's all about. And you get this. A lot of us get this. The investment in people is the only thing that matters. Last week in the small groups, we talked about finding a place to serve. You have a ministry. Find an opportunity to invest in people as a group. Find an opportunity to invest in people individually and as a group. And if you're doing one, fantastic. If you're not doing one, find one. Find one. And there's something so powerful that happens when we realize this fact. None of this is even ours. None of this, anything on this earth, it's not even ours. It's temporary, and God provided. He created all of this for us. It's not ours. And when, we can, when that light bulb moment goes off in our brain, like the manager, 
When we have that aha moment, a fire gets lit in it, we start to realize, no, this isn't even mine. Why am I being so tight-fisted? I'm going to leverage it for people because that's what Jesus wants me to do. That's what he's asking me to do. It's not your stuff, not your possessions, and especially it's not your money. And when you can realize that, wow, you'll be set free from materialism and selfishness when you can realize that and start to leverage everything that you have. We're just managers. We, you and I, are just managers. So let's be wise managers. Let's be good managers. Let's be shrewd managers, making good judgments and investing in people. And before I go, I want to give you three tips. If we would sit down and have a cup of coffee, which I'm down, if you want to, hit me up. We could talk about what we would do. Some tips. Number one, be strategic about your investments and set goals. Don't just be willy-nilly. Don't just like react. Be strategic and intentional and set some goals. And here's, one that, here's the one that, I, that, I, that I've made a decision, Emily and I, my wife and I. When we first got stable income and, and, and regular income, we decided we were going to tithe. We're like, you know what, we're going to tithe. We're going to give 10% of our income to the church, the local church. doesn't matter what church, the local church, the church body. Because we realized that that is going to break the chains of materialism and it's going to help us reiterate the fact that this isn't even mine. God gave me 100, he just wants 10 so that he can use the local church to invest in people. And we got all these charitable organizations doing wonderful things. But I believe if the local church, and not the church organization as a whole, but the church is you and me, individuals. If the church was doing what the church was supposed to be doing, the charitable organizations wouldn't have to. So if you want to invest in a group of people, in a body of believers, a body of people that should be going and changing the world one person at a time, it's the local church. And you can invest there and be strategic and set a goal. Man, it may not be tithing, but set a goal and go get it. Get after it, investing in people. And the, and, the, and the phase two of this is start with one person in mind. Just start with one person in mind. You ever watch a Miss America pageant or Miss Universe pageant? I want to end world hunger. <laughs> of course you do. We all want to end world hunger, don't we? We don't want people to go hunger, hungry, you know? But I can't feed everybody. You can't feed everybody. But guess what? I can feed one. I can feed one. Whatever that cause is for you that's on your heart, you can do it for one person, can't you? So start with one person. You know how God says when you're faithful with a little, you'll be entrusted with more? I believe that one will become two. Two may become five. Five to ten, and before long, you're making a dent. And that's exciting. Start with one person in mind. So pray this week. Ask God this week, who's the individual in my life that I come in contact with every day at work or in my family or on the street? Who's that one person? Show me, God so that I can begin to invest in that one person. You see, we say that we want to love all, but I think when we say that we love all, it's just an excuse not to love one. I want to love everybody. And that stops us from actually engaging and being actionable and actually doing it for one person. And my favorite phrase is, do for one what you wish you could do for all. You wish you could feed everybody, but you can do it for one person. Do it. Whatever that is, invest in a person. And the final thing, to put a bow on it, it's easier to invest when you realize it ain't yours. When you realize that this isn't even yours, and it's all going away at the end of this life, it's so much easier for us to say, God, where do you want me to invest this? He's saying, people, find opportunities to invest in people. So you got people that your fingerprint is on in eternity. When you show up, they are welcoming you and excited that you're there and you're able to party with them forever. And what you do now affects what you will do and what you will have then. It's that important. People are eternal. Invest in people. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much that you've given us life, that you've given us everything, all of these resources and, and, and everything on this earth, God, and help us to understand that it's yours first. And help break the bind of materialism and maybe the selfish me, 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 me. And let us just be a, a tool for you. Let us just leverage everything at our disposal for you. Investing in people one person at a time. Being the hands and feet of Christ and maybe possibly one day, and I know that we can, change our community, change our world, change our nation. If we would just actually live this thing out. Empower us to do so. Show us the one person. And help us to be generous and kind and loving to those around us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.